study the Word of God, yes or no? All right. Uh, the, the topic of today, we're still in this expect more sermon series, you know, taking your faith to the next level. And a couple of weeks ago, we, we took a survey and said, what are you struggling with the most? What's keeping you from believing uh, for the miraculous? You know, what's keeping you from, from believing for the unbelievable, uh, for the impossible? Because, you know, obviously nothing is impossible with God. And uh, the first response, the most common response was doubt. Well, I just have doubts. Okay, so we addressed that last week. Uh, if you did not pick up those, uh, if you weren't here last Sunday or watch it online, uh, make sure you go back and watch how to defeat doubt in your life. It'll help you to become a person of faith. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, it's, it's, maybe you don't think about, but every single, uh, every single Sunday afternoon, I get beat up. And it's not my wife, and it's not my kids, and it's not you. It's actually me. I just beat myself up for everything that I should have said and everything that I shouldn't have said and why did I say that and I talked about dogs and how cats don't go to heaven but dogs do or I'll say something <laughs> weird and then people and then people get that response and I go home and say why did I say that don't they know I was just joking I wasn't being serious and and I beat myself up over what I should have said or what I shouldn't have said actually last last Sunday I, I listened to it again I almost always listen to my sermons because I want to I want to do better at, at, at what the Lord has called me to. I think we need to improve and get better. And last Sunday, actually, I didn't beat myself up that much, everybody. It was a really good, solid word that was encouraging. So there you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, we'll see what happens today. Who knows? Um, and I want to talk to you today. The second thing, defeating doubt was the, the big one. The second big one that, that you said, I need to know about this. It's guilt, that a lot of you are not believing for the miraculous because of the guilt that you constantly feel in life, that you feel like you never measure up, that, that, that you're not close enough to God, whatever the case is, you just feel guilty all the time. And today, I've been praying for you uh, all, all week long, that today guilt would just fall to the, to the ground, lifeless, void of any power, and that you leave this place not feeling guilty, but feeling grateful, grateful for the grace of God. That's what we're going to talk about today, grace. And, and I'll tell you this, unless you understand grace, you won't operate in the level of faith that you're called to. You have to understand grace. You have to understand the grace of God. In fact, <clears throat> our mission here at New Song is to perpetuate, to propagate the gospel of grace, helping people become passionately devoted followers of Christ. If there's any topic that I've studied on the, the most in my own personal life, it's the topic of grace. I've studied it inside and out. In fact, for three and a half years, outside of prepping for sermons, I only studied grace, the grace of God, for about three and a half years and that was quite some time, time ago now, but it was life-changing. And I can, I can teach on this topic uh, so very, very easily because it just flows from within me. However, this past week, I struggled to put this message together. I mean, I, I just, it was like every time I was getting, uh, you know, making headway on it or have an idea or have a thought and pray about it, it was like I was just fighting in the sermon, struggling with it. And, and it confused me because I can speak about grace so easily. It just comes naturally from me because I've been changed by it so much. And I realized over this past week that it wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't have anything to say or that, that, that the Lord didn't have anything to say. I realized that I was struggling for you, that, that I, I felt like I was in a battle uh, for you. Um, and, and it turned into a time of prayer and it turned into a time of, oh, Lord, help me, because the devil has been whispering in, in, in your ears for a long time that you cannot be a person of faith and you're not in right relationship with God and he's shaming you and he's putting embarrassment into your life and your heart and he, he's whispering to you these thoughts and these, these words and these declarations of you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. You can't move forward, you're guilty. You're, you should be ashamed of yourself. And, and I, I realized that this week it wasn't, I don't know that it was a battle that I was facing as much as just in this battle with you, believing for you, fighting for you in faith. And, and, and if there, there are some pastors sitting in this room here today, they know exactly what I'm talking about. But there, there are some topics that just come so easily, yet it's a struggle because we really fight the good fight of faith with you. When, you're, when you don't know what pastors are doing, we're fighting for you. Did you know that? We're praying for you. We're we're believing God for you. We're, we're preparing for this moment. So listen up. If you struggle with this topic, listen up today because you're going to leave today changed, transformed, not by what I say, but what the Holy Spirit says to you 
personally. It's gonna be a life-changing day for you, I, I, I pray. But in fact, let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, change our lives, change our hearts. Lord, I declare that victory will be experienced today, that guilt will, will fall powerless to the ground, and gratefulness will, will arise. Worship, confidence, security in Christ will arise in all of our hearts today as we listen to your word and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so point number one, there's so many fill in the blanks, I decided to fill them in for you. And also because there's so many verses today, I was running out of space. And uh, I just, I, I had to save some space on the sermon notes. So number one, guilt is a product of things that I have done, things I haven't done, things I should have done, or things that I can't do. Now, all of you, really, you're going you're gonna to look at that list and say, like, yep, he's right. I should have, I could have, I, I, I wish I would have, but I didn't, and now I can't. And, and some, of you live, some of you live underneath a level, underneath a load of guilt that, that really keeps you from being who God has called you to be. Did you know that? And, and it's the things that, well, I should have done this, and, and, but I haven't d done this, and well, I, I can't even do that. And it's so bad for some of you. In fact, I heard another pastor say this, that I, th I thought he worded this so well. He said, there's some, there's some of you that are so guilt-ridden, you, you think things like this. There are things that I haven't even thought about yet, but I should be thinking about. I just don't know what they are, and I feel guilty about that. <laughs> like, surely I'm missing Something, something's happening. I should know about it in my kids, and I just feel guilty because I don't know about it. And how many, how many can say you struggle with guilt like that? Like you, you just struggle with it. I'm going to help you today. I'm going to help you today. In fact, guilt number two, guilt is the enemy of faith, and it steals your hope, and it steals your joy, and it steals your peace. But I, I wrote the word, word hope there because guilt actually it steals this confident expectation that you're meant to have in Christ Jesus. That, that Christ fills us with hope. Biblical hope is confident expectation. Well, how can you live in expectation if you're actually thinking guilty thoughts all the time? And, and, and I want you to, to go to this portion of Scripture in 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 20. It says, even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. Let's stop right there. I want you to know something. That God is greater than your feelings. That God is greater than your feelings. That your feelings do not have to dictate how you live life and how you live a life of faith. Your feelings don't have to dictate that. In fact, I want to share with you something that I share in counseling sessions all the time. I'll, I'll always say it like this, that your, your feelings are real, but that does not mean that they're valid. They're real, but it doesn't mean they're valid. So, so if you have a... Um, you know, if, if you have a, a, a fear, let's just say that, well, I, you know, I, I have this fear and I, I don't think this is going to work out. Well, a lot of people have fears, but that doesn't mean those fears are valid. It just means they're real. Or, or I feel guilty. I, I just feel really guilty. And that's a very real feeling. But can I tell you, in Christ, you're, my, you're not meant to live like that. that. That actually God is greater than your feelings. That he's greater his grace is greater than the sins that you've committed in your life. So you feel guilty, but I'm here to tell you God is greater. That your feelings are real, but they are not valid. Everybody's seeing that. Your feelings are real, but that doesn't mean they're telling you the truth. In fact, I've found it this way, that feelings lie to you. Your feelings will lie to you. In fact, some of you are, 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 are you know this full well because in your head, your, your spouse hates you, but in reality, your spouse doesn't hate you. They love you. But you, you're, you're, you're thinking, but it, but it feels like they hate me. It feels like they can't stand me. Well, your feelings are real, but that does not mean that they're valid. And we see this all the time in the counseling world. So he says, even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. So dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. How many know that we're supposed to approach the throne of God with boldness, the Bible says? Well, it's hard to do that if you feel guilty. 
And you're like, well, I don't want to feel guilty anymore. I don't want you to either. In fact, let me say it differently. God doesn't want you to either. He doesn't want you to live a life of guilt. Verse 22, and a lot of people would just stop right there. At, at, at verse 21, let's go to verse 22. And we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. Well, there it is right there, Pastor Justin. There it is right there. I can't do it. I, I, I try. I try to live the Christian life. I try not to say those words. I try not to think that thought. I, I, I try not to, to do whatever, it, but I just keep doing it anyway, and I can't please God, and I might as well give up, and I just feel guilty. If I go into heaven, I'm just getting there by the skin of my teeth. Can I tell you something? What a miserable way to live life. But, but, but Pastor, it even says it right there. That I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. I can't live the life that God always wants me to live. And I feel guilty about that. I can't do it. Let me, let me, let me encourage you today. You're right. You can't. Well, pastor, that's not encouraging at all. You're not helping me at all. Oh, I am. I am. In fact, I'm, I'm going to teach you some things that are so powerful this morning, but, but we, we, we got to kind of lay the foundation. Before we get into obedience, can we just lay the, the foundation of grace? Number three, write this down, that God never expected perfection from me. And he never expected perfection from you. Let, let me prove this to you. God knew, he knew about your imperfection. He knew that you were gonna drop the ball. He knew that you were going to sin. He knew that you were gonna be rebellious. He knew you were gonna make bad choices. He knew that you were gonna say bad words. He knew that you were gonna think bad thoughts. He knew it. And that's why before the world began, God had a plan. And his plan, the Bible is very clear, before mankind was even created, before humanity came into the picture, God knew that humanity was going to be sinful and he had a plan in place and it was Christ Jesus, the Son of God, coming into the world, living a perfect, sinless life, taking on the sins of the world on himself, making atonement for that, dying on the cross, paying the penalty of our sins, but then being raised to life three days later, proving that he really had the, 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 the power the power to forgive sins, that he really is the Son of God. God had that plan before time began. He knew that you weren't going to be good enough. He knew that you weren't going to be perfect. He knew that you were going to drop the ball. That's why he sent his son. And that's the good news. That's the gospel of grace. Because God knew it. Well, pastor, I can't measure up. No, you can't. And God knew it. And he sent his son. That's the gospel. In fact, I'm going to read some verses to you. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. You are, when you're looking at me today, I want you to know that you're looking at a person who has sinned and failed and rebelled against God. I don't like it. I wish I wouldn't have done it. But I have been forgiven for it. Because there's no one that's righteous. Not one. In fact, if, if that wasn't enough, just two verses later, Romans chapter 3, verse 12, no one does good, not a single one. How's that? So if you say... You say, well, I can't live up to the Bible. Can you live up to that? Because all of you already have. There's things in your life that don't glorify God. There, there are things that you've done and said, thought that doesn't glorify Christ. In fact, Romans chapter 3 is a great, I'm, I'm going to continue in there just for another verse. In fact, let's read this together. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. 
That's what the law does. Well, pastor, I can't measure up. The good news is you've discovered what the Bible has been saying all along, that you're right. In yourself, you cannot measure up. You can't. But let's keep reading. Verse 22 says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. It applies to everyone. So nobody can say, well, I'm too far gone. Well, if they say I'm too far gone, or if you're saying I'm too far gone, can I tell you, you are calling God a liar. I wouldn't do that. Not wise. It's impossible for God to lie. That's what we've been studying about. Hebrews says it. It's impossible for God to lie. And the Bible says that you are made right with God through faith, that whoever believes, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be and are saved. That's grace. My question is, have you called upon Christ for salvation. Have you done that? So write this down, something that I've, I teach all the time, and I'm going to continue to teach it because it's our mission here at New Song. It's, our, it's, our, it's what we do. Number four, I am made right with God by grace through faith in Christ Jesus alone. My works don't make me right with God. My aiming at perfection doesn't make me right with God. What makes me right with God is not obedience. It is faith and faith alone. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that if you try to add to it, you're taking away from the message of grace. We are, we are saved by grace, not of works. So that way you and I can't boast about it. It's all Jesus. He gets all the glory. You get none. You know why? Because you're a sinner saved by grace. There's no one who is righteous. No, not one. There's not one single good person in the whole earth. And in the gospel of grace, Jesus gets all the glory, and he's the only one who deserves it. Can I get an amen to that? So you're made right with God through faith. And the Bible is so filled with verses that say this. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3, 8 and 9. Paul writes from a prison cell. He says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I love that phrase, infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. It depends on faith. So Paul is saying, I'm not depending upon my own righteousness. I don't really have righteousness to offer. I don't, I don't have that in me. I have sin in me. So I cannot offer what I do not have. So I'm depending solely on Jesus Christ. I'm depending on faith in Christ Jesus, and I am made right with God. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Christ made us right with God. Christ did. He made us pure and holy and freed us from sin. I like 1 John 1.9. 1, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All of it. How much? All of it? All of it, pastor? All of it? That if you're in Christ, if you're trusted in Christ alone for salvation... He is and has purified you from all unrighteousness. Can I tell you the beauty of it? So Isaiah 61.10 is a beautiful portion of Scripture, and it says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. 
and it's pure white. It's, it's spotless white. And you didn't create the robe. You didn't make the robe. You didn't have anything to do with the robe. God said, when you trusted in Christ for salvation, God said, I'm going to make you new inside and out. I'm going to put on you a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness. And the problem with that is, for those of us who are in Christ but still struggling with guilt, the problem with that is we see the beauty of the robe We see the garment of salvation and we say, thank you, Lord. But then we go out to, we we go out to work, we go home, we we go uh, into normal day-to-day, Monday through Saturday, work, family, neighborhood, friends. And we do things and we say things and we think things. And we look down at our robe of righteousness and our garments of salvation. We look down and say, oh, no, I've stained them. Look look at all these spots. Look, I said that bad word. Look, look, there's a stain on my robe. Is that how you feel? But, But look, look. But I did that, and I shouldn't have, and I knew I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have thought that. I shouldn't have looked at that. I shouldn't have went there. And look at all these stains. And the devil is whispering in your ear, yeah, look at all the stains. That's why I tell people that repentance is not just a moment of, when we come to Christ, we come to Christ in faith and repentance, the Bible says. It's two sides of the same coin. That, that we discover we are sinners in need of a Savior, so we place our trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, and we are forgiven of our sins. We are made new in Christ. He puts on us a robe, of, and we're so grateful for that robe of righteousness. But then we go in the world, and it just seems to get all stained. And a lot of it's our own doing. I tell people, don't just come to the Lord once in repentance. It's yours to live a life of repentance. So every I'm, 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 I'm teaching you how to live free now. I'm teaching you how to live free. That, that when I fail in my walk with Christ, and I certainly do, that when I fail, I just go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I stained my robe. Oh, Oh, what am I gonna? Have you ever have you ever spilled something at just the worst time? You know what I'm talking about? At just the worst time, you know. Or has anybody else done that to you too? Like that, you just feel like they're the ones that are spewing stuff all over you. You know, one time I was I was getting up to lead worship in Milwaukee. We had to wear suits every Sunday morning. How many are grateful for new song? Everybody, we don't gotta wear a suit. All right, so. And, and Isaiah uh, had a little reflux condition. He's my second born. And I'm getting up there to lead worship. And I'm holding my baby boy. And he pukes all over my suit. I mean, all over it. It's the white, it's the white curdled stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Like chunkage. We're talking chunkage, everybody. And it smelled. It reeked. And I, I'm like, oh, I got to lead worship right now. I got to go up in front of these hundreds of people. And wor- so I, I go in there. I start, you know, clean it off. And I take a wet rag. And I just think it is what it is. And, and I, I, I get most of it off. And the whole time I'm leading worship, I'm smelling vomit, y'all. I mean, just like, oh, God is great. You know, because it's just ev- everywhere. I have no idea what that has to do with this. Oh, yeah, I do now. I do now. <laughs> so a lot of times, a lot of times you think others are around you, and boy, pastors are just around. And have you ever been around so many people who are ungodly that it made you feel like you're guilty of their sins? Well, I'm just around it all day, and oh, pastor, it's just, I come home, and I'm mentally and spiritually exhausted because I'm just around filth all day long. I hear it all day long. It's like somebody's just spewing stuff out and getting your robe dirty. But let's, let's, let's face it, everybody. How many times have you gone somewhere, you wanted to look all nice, and you did it yourself? That you spilled something on yourself. In fact, there's, if you ever go to my office, you look at the back of my door, there's always shirts hanging on the back of my door. You know why? Because on Sunday mornings, every now and then, I'll spill something on me, and I, I want to have a backup shirt in my office if I need to change. True story. Some of you know that you've seen the shirts right there hanging on the back of my door. Those are there for a reason. Because I, I, sometimes I stain myself. 
And I've learned in my spiritual life to go to God and say, God, I confess that. I said that. I thought that. I looked at that. I did that. I went there. I, I'm sorry. Lord, would you help me? And the Bible says if I confess my sins to him, he's faithful and just to cleanse me of my sins. He purifies me. He keeps my robe white. Listen, I can't keep my own robe white. I can't do it. I have to rely on him and him alone. So some of you feel guilty as if you're responsible for keeping your robe white. You couldn't put it, you didn't make the robe and you can't keep the robe white. You can't do it. You don't have enough willpower in you. But Jesus, oh, he's so good. He washes us clean. He purifies us from all the sin. So now my sins are forgiven. Not just my past, but my present and my future sins. They're all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He made atonement for all of them. And he clothed me with this robe of righteousness that I don't deserve. And sometimes I, I get stains on it. And he just continually washes it and purifies me and cleanses me. From it. See, a lot of people grew up with, as, as soon as you make a mistake, it's, it's as if the robe of righteousness just comes off and you're no longer a Christian. That is not the gospel of grace. That is not the, that's, that's legalism. That's works-based salvation. That is not the gospel. No, I've, I have received a robe of righteousness and in my relationship with God, as I continue to go to God and love God and worship God and surrender my life to him, he keeps the robe clean. He purifies me. He purifies me from me. Oh, that's grace. And because I can't clean my own robe, but he does, And I'm always in right standing with him. But let me say it this way. Number five, that God affirms my faith in Christ by making me both holy and righteous. He affirms my faith in Christ by putting holiness in me and righteousness in me. He affirms my faith in Christ. Holiness and righteousness are two separate things. They are not the same word. They, they do not have the same meaning. Righteousness, the, the most basic definition of righteousness is right standing with God. Righteousness. I'm in right standing with God. Well, I am in right standing with God, not because of me, but because of Jesus. That's how I'm in right standing with God, because I've trusted in Christ as Savior, and I've been made holy. Holiness is not righteousness. The biblical definition of holiness, and again in simple terms, is being, it, it is to be set apart from that which is common. Set apart from that which is common. The Bible says that as Christians, we are on the narrow road. Those who don't know Jesus, they are on the wide road. Christianity is not common in the world. Did you know that? It's not common. It's the narrow way. It's the narrow road. And the Bible says that we have been made holy. We have been set apart from that which is common. I have been set apart for Jesus Christ. I've been set apart for the glory of God. I've been set apart with a purpose on my life to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. I have been set apart from that which is common. Okay, now watch this, everybody. 2 Corinthians 5, 5.21, not, not on the screen or on your notes, but he says, For God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, okay. So when Jesus is your righteousness, when Jesus is your righteousness, it's impossible for you to be more righteous than you are right now. Why? Because Jesus is your righteousness. And he cannot be more righteous than he already is. So if you are in Christ, if you have truly trusted Christ as Savior, 
and you've been saved by grace through faith, you've been made new in Christ Jesus. Listen, new song, you will never be more righteous than you are right now. Why? Because God isn't looking at your righteousness. He's looking at his son. He's looking at Jesus. You're the, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You'll never be more righteous than you are right now. So you can pray audacious prayers. You can pray. You can pray big prayers as if Jesus himself were praying them. Why? Because he is your righteousness. And you'll never be more righteous than you are right now. Do you understand grace a little bit better now? See, you're depending on your works to make you, to, 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 you say, well, if I'm good enough, if I'm obedient enough, then God will listen to me. That is works-based righteousness, which is not real righteousness at all. No, I'm in Christ. I've been made new. And when God looks at me and my righteousness, he's actually looking at his son. Therefore, I can pray for things that I never used to pray for. I can believe for the unbelievable because it's coming from one who is in right standing with God. So you've been made righteous. You've been made holy. You're in right standing with God, and you are set apart from that which is common. Now, let's read this in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Some of you were once like that, but you were, meaning very sinful is the previous verses to that, very sinful. Some of you were like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What's this, Hebrews 10, 10? For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. And just a few verses later, this is where it's gonna, I, I pray this is where it kicks in and that you understand this. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You, you have been made perfect and you're continually being set apart from that which is common. You see it? You have been made perfect. You have been made right with God. You've been clothed with a robe of righteousness and he's not done with you yet. Okay, so the best way I noticed, God just really gave this to me this, this, just a few days ago. On Wednesday, the Lord just spoke this to me. Pursuing holiness is my reaction to receiving holiness. I cannot produce holiness on my own. I am made holy. I am made pure. I am made perfect. I am made righteous by the grace of God. And my reaction to being made holy is to pursue holiness. So you've been made holy, new song. You've been made holy. Now act like it. Now live like it. Now think like it. And the Holy Spirit, you say, Pastor, I cannot do that on my own. Again, you're right. You can't. But the Holy Spirit is in us, empowering us to live out the Christian life that we've been called to live and the Holy Spirit will help you. The problem is people aren't listening to the Holy Spirit. So, so every single day, you've already been made holy, you've already been made righteous, you, you've already been made perfect, you've been saved by grace through faith, and your reaction to being made holy is to pursue holiness. Every day, you're gonna have decisions to make. Are you gonna say that word? And the, the Holy Spirit is gonna say, don't say that word. Well, you got to listen, and you got to obey. The Holy Spirit is going to say, well, you, you shouldn't go see that movie, but I, but I really want to. Okay, what's more important to you, pursuing holiness or watching an un ungodly movie? What's more important to you? Well, my wife and I, we just made decisions in our life. We're just not going to see things that the Holy Spirit says no to. 
So we, we just don't. And if we have questions, there's, there's websites we can go to. Hey, what's in that movie? I want to know what's in that movie. Like Plugged In Online is one of Common Sense Media. I want to know what's in the movie. Okay, I'm not going to see that movie. Easy. It's not, a, it's not a battle in our world. But I really want to go see that movie. I, 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 well, I'd rather be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Come on, everybody. I'm trying to help, especially at this time of year. Can I just tell you, uh, 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 and again, I won't tell you, I'll never tell you what movies to see or not see, but can I tell you, we're at the time of year around Halloween where very grotesque, demonic movies come out. You need, you need to uh, listen to the Holy Spirit. That's all I'm going to say about that. Just listen to the Holy Spirit. I just want to honor God in all things at all times. So I live my life that way. Do I make mistakes? Absolutely. I stain my robe more than I'd like to admit. But it's still on me. And Jesus continually purifies it, cleanses me and washes, washes me. And I'm not the man I used to be. And I, and I am not the man I will be. I'll be better by the grace and the power of God upon my life. So pursuing holiness is my reaction to receiving holiness. First Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. So if you understand grace and you say, I, I, I love the grace of God, good. Praise God. It's life-changing. But the grace of God was given to you so that you would be thoroughly changed, so that you would be made new. And you're not meant to live like you used to live before you knew Christ. Now you're a child of God. Be obedient to your father. Dr. Mark Rutland, one of my favorite teachers, uh, Bible teachers, really. He was the pref professor at a Bible college at, uh, at ORU in Oklahoma, and, and a student came up, and he just taught about holiness. And the, the student says, well, well, Dr. Rutland, what is it? Am, am I made holy, or do I have to be holy? And he said, absolutely, now you got it. Now you understand. Yes, you've been made holy. And your reaction to that holiness is to pursue holiness. You say, well, pastor, I, I don't know how to do that. And, and I, if you know me, I'm, I'm all about application. I, I don't like it when pastors talk for 35 minutes and never say anything or never give you any application. You know, what, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know about you, but every single week I try to give an application to you every, every week that you can go out and live. And I, I just thought for those in the room who say, pastor, how do how, how do I live a holy life? How do I pursue holiness in my life? I, I'm going to give you three things. Your reaction to being made holy. Three simple things. You might want to write these down. It's so simple. The first one is disconnect from the world. Just disconnect from the world. You, you know, Romans 12 says, don't conform any longer to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform any longer to the ways of this world. Remember, you've been made holy, so act like it. You have been set apart from that which is common. Just because everybody else is going to go see that movie doesn't mean that you are. You've been set apart. You've been set apart from that which is common. You see it? So don't conform any longer to the ways of this world. If you're on the narrow road, don't live like you're on the wide one because you might not be on the narrow one after all. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Because when you've been made holy, I've told you this, when you've been made right with God, when you've been made new, your want to changes. Your want to changes. Now I want to obey Christ. I want to live a godly life. So I'm pursuing holiness. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm not going to live like the rest of the world. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to live like those who don't know Jesus. I'm going to disconnect from that. The Bible says that, we're, that we live in the world, but we're not of the world, right? And so you, you still have to go to work. You still have to, to, to you know, pay the bills. All, all, I'm, you you got to raise your family. You got to take them to school, all those things. But that doesn't mean you have to be like everybody else. You, you, number two, you got to flee, flee from temptation, 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the, on the name of the Lord out of, a, 
out of a pure heart. Let, let me say this, everybody. Every time that you flee from temptation, you're actually pursuing holiness. The two go hand in hand. Every time you flee from temptation, you are pursuing holiness. How do you know if you're pursuing holiness? Are you fleeing from temptation? You're pursuing holiness. You get it now? And it's a disconnect from the world. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna live like everybody else lives. And the third thing is, you have to learn and obey the word of God. Psalm, Psalm 119 says, I've hidden your, hurt, your, your word in my heart, God, that I might not sin against you. So you have to learn and obey the word of, of the Lord. You have to learn and obey the word of God. And it's that simple, everybody. It's that simple. That's how you, that's how you pursue holiness. Disconnect from the world, flee from temptation, learn and obey the word of God. So simple. And by the way, in that, it's obvious. You, you, should, you should also pray. You, you should also seek the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You, you, should th you should seek everything that God has for your life. And I'll tell you, he will empower you to live the life that you've been called to live in Christ Jesus. Do you receive the word of the Lord today, yes or no? All right, let's stand up together. I'm gonna ask that nobody moves around at this point. This is a very... Today, today I've given the gospel a message. I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've taught you the gospel. I've taught about the grace of God. I've taught about the way of salvation. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, God's son. The only way that you're made right with God is by placing your trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. It's when a person comes to their senses and says, I'm a sinner in need of a savior and I'm fully trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. I'm not gonna trust in my works. I'm not gonna trust in my version of righteousness because there's nobody who's righteous. I'm gonna trust that God's word is true and, and what he says is true. And he says that every single person who puts their faith in Christ Jesus is made right with God, no matter who they are. That righteousness is gained through faith not through works. So today I'm gonna to put my trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and in him alone. And if you have not done that, I'm gonna give you a chance to do it. I will not call you out. I will not embarrass you. You go public when you, go, when you get baptized, but today is not a baptism Sunday. Today's a day to call out to Jesus for salvation. Could you bow your heads with me just in one, for a moment here, nobody looking around. Let me ask you a question. Are you right with God? Are you in right standing with God? Have you trusted in Christ alone for salvation? And all I'm gonna do is have you raise your hand and then we're gonna pray. That's all that there is to it. So if you're in this room or watching online, let me ask, are you right with God? Have you put your faith in Christ Jesus for salvation? And if you say, Pastor Justin, I wanna do that today. Today is a beautiful day. It's the perfect day. It'll never be more right than it is right now. It'll, it'll never be more of the perfect moment than it is right now. And I'm gonna ask you, with nobody looking around, just raise your hand really high. Let me see who you are. All I wanna do is pray for you. All right, I can see, I can see those hands. Is there anybody else? Just give you a couple more moments here. Is there anybody else? All right, you can put your hands down. I'm so proud of you. Four people who raised their hand this morning, we're gonna pray together. And it's simply a prayer that goes like this. Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a savior. If you raised your hand, in your, it just in your, own, in your own way, pray that prayer to God. Jesus, I'm, I'm a sinner in need of a savior and I am putting my trust wholeheartedly in you today. I realize that I cannot save myself and I'm trusting in the work that you did on the cross. I'm trusting in resurrection power. You proved that you were and are the son of God. And your word says that every single person who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So to, to the best of my ability, the only way I know how, I'm calling out to you for salvation. Save me. Now, according to your word, Lord, where it's impossible for you to lie, according to your word, as I have prayed this prayer in faith, and as I have trusted in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, you said that you save every single person who believes, no matter who they are. Those are your words, Lord. 
And I thank you that at this very moment, I have been, I have been saved by grace through faith. You placed on me a garment of salvation, a robe of righteousness that is sparkling white. And I want to say thank you for saving me. That I don't have to live in guilt any longer. I don't have to live in shame any longer. I can live a confident life in Christ Jesus because I've been made right with God. That when you look at me, God, you don't see my failures. You see the righteousness of your son, Jesus Christ. And I say, thank you for saving me. New song, can we just lift up our hands and say, thank you for saving me, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you for pouring out your love in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I love you so much. I love you so much, and I worship you with all my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Thank you, Lord.